Today, I'm really excited to talk about the daily routines and habits of creative people, artists, musicians, brand builders, entrepreneurs. I want to figure out and unpack the routines and the habits that make creative people successful. Welcome to the Unfiltered Podcast. I'm your host, Raf, and this is my co-host, Sahir. What up, man? What's good, bro? Man, today I'm really excited to talk about the daily routines and habits of uh, creative people like artists, musicians, brand builders, entrepreneurs. You know, if you're doing something creative, I want to figure out and unpack the routines and the habits that make creative people successful. You know, I've struggled with this all my life. And all of our you know favorite artists and musicians they've struggled with this all their lives too right um and and i think the reason is it's because routines are are not set from the beginning like you're not born with a great routine no you create your own routine by going through experiences by going through life and you know figuring out what works for you you know and you know i'm a first gen immigrant and i came to america uh for college you know in college i had to have a certain number of classes enrolled in uh, and if i didn't you know i'd get kicked out you know but at the same time i had all these creative pursuits all these creative needs you know i i had to do uh, you know i had to scratch my creative itch you know so to speak and i but i still had to go to college i couldn't just say like uh, okay i'm gonna take a break this semester and go do this you know music thing as a dj no, I, I couldn't do that. I had to do both at the same time, you know, and then fast forward uh, in the work life. I had to have a corporate job at the same time, build the brands that I wanted to build. I couldn't just do one or the other. They all both worked hand in hand. And then again, fast forward when I, when I, I had to build my tech company as well as the music brand for the past decade, just because like I could, they, they, again, they both worked hand in hand and I couldn't separate the two. I couldn't leave one for the other. I had to do both. So over time I had to figure out, you know, what really works for me, you know? Um, so sometimes it didn't go well at all, you know, and other times it worked really well. And so through that process, I started to figure out something that would work for me uh, as a routine. And, you know, I, I made that assumption that, okay, things are finally working and, you know, I got in a little rhythm and I was feeling really good, but then everything came crashing down and it wasn't just COVID. Okay. I, I remember this like yesterday, like it was 2020. Uh, I was, uh, I was a NR at Sony and I, we were planning as a family to move to uh, Los Angeles. We we're in Minneapolis and um, COVID happened. And so everything went crashing down. All the plans, all the ideas that we had, not gonna happen anymore, it's COVID. All right, I didn't even know when, to, when we could even move to Los Angeles after this, you know? And so I was like, shit, you know, I gotta do something else. Gotta pivot or, you know, at least make some new ideas, work on some new ideas. So I picked up some new projects and I worked like crazy during COVID. Um, you know, I was, I, I just figured out a new routine that works for me. You know, we were all at home. I was working on certain projects that I could do from my home office. And, and then I got in a rhythm again. I got a new routine. I was getting really happy. And then, um, my wife came to me with those three scary words for any man to hear. <laughs> we are pregnant. <laughs> I was like, what? Oh, all right. Man. I just got in a rhythm and everything's going to change. And, right. you know, I, I wasn't ready for this change, you know, but I, I knew the change was coming. So throughout this pregnancy, I started, you know, I, I got even more motivated because it was like an amazingly, you know, happy uh, news that we're going to, uh, we're going to have a son. So I started working harder and harder. And I, I was literally working like 24 seven, like every waking hour of the day, just to like make impact, you know, while preparing for the pregnancy. 
Um, and then, you know, our son came. He, he came three months early. He was a preemie. And those few months in the hospital felt like a lifetime. You know, um, I had to take a little bit of a sabbatical from my work. And during this time, you know, there was, you know, I loved those moments with my kid, but I was uh, going through this internal conflict of like, what should I do? What should I do now? Like, is this it? Like, is this the end of those dreams, the goals? Like, what sh can I get back into them? When can I get back into them? I had no answers, you know? And it was like, I want, I know I want to be there for everybody in my family. At the same time, being there for everybody in my family means me pursuing my goals and dreams as well like i want my son to grow up seeing his dad pursuing his goals and dreams you know like i needed that in my life so i couldn't just give it all up so i was i had all these questions you know i was just like wondering should i give up the business should i not should i do part-time should i get multiple jobs um what should i do you know but i knew there was a way i knew there was a way to get everything that you know i wanted um, you know, there were people with five kids. There are people with three kids. They're, they're following the dreams. It's not just me. Um, you know, I knew the answer was out there. And uh, so I started, uh, I decided that I would ask myself a different set of questions. Not what can I do now, but more like how can I do everything that I want to do? I found out the answer to that question is a rigid routine. Uh, Jocko Willink, a Navy SEAL, he likes to say discipline equals freedom. He wrote a book on that and I completely agree with Jocko because discipline is freedom. Discipline and routine is how I won my freedom back. You know, this is how I figured out how I could do everything. I needed to do a little bit of everything and I, and I started working on that. You know, and really the, you know, this episode isn't really about me. You know, it's not about Sahir. It's about you, the audience. What works for you? You know, does a morning routine work for you? Does like what, what kind of routine gets you the goals that you want in your life? You know, like there's different routines for everybody. All these internet gurus talk about so many things, dude. Like Alex Hormozzi, he says, fuck routines. All right. He just wakes up and he starts working. You know, he'll wake up early, but he'll start working. He's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. On the other spectrum, Tony Robbins, he owns like 40, 50 companies. I don't know. He might even be a billionaire. He wakes up and jumps in an ice bath every day. And he has this like two, three hour routine every day. Okay. He, he does it with a routine. Alex Hormozzi does it without a routine. So what really works? You know, those are the questions we want to answer today and at least pick on the threads of, you know, right. and, um, this episode is really about finding out what works for you. You know, so I want to say, like Sahir, you know, on that note, what works for you? What are the kind of routines that you've been following? You know, you have a one-year-old. I have a two-year-old. Right. What, what are your daily routines these days? Yeah, one-year-old. Oh, man. Um, wow, that was a lot, bro. Like, I just, I just, like, coming off of everything that you've said, like, I can really feel like, yeah, the, the part about uh, discipline being freedom. Uh, and having some sort of uh, a semblance of intention throughout your day. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, so for right now, because I do have a one-year-old uh, and I also have a dog. So there's a, you know, there's, they have their schedules and as their primary caregivers and the fact that I love them, love them both to death, I want to, you know, do right. And I want them to have a sense of normalcy, something that is consistent for them. And that means that when I wake up uh, at, what is it, like 6.30, around-ish, she's, us she's usually awake by then, my, my daughter. Uh, before having kids, I never knew kids wake up this early. What time, what time did you wake up before kids? Me? Look, yeah. I, I, I still woke up super early. Okay. But I just didn't know like kids wake up at this yeah, time. No, like, they I thought like, dude. Like, they, <laughs> but they go to sleep earlier too, they right? They do, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just... And how long does yours like sleep for? Is it like 10 hours, right? Yeah, like, yeah 10, 12, uh, yeah, right, 10, 10, 11 hours. I mean, a good night's sleep is 12 hours. Like how much longer can they stay asleep? Exactly. You know? <laughs> so like, yeah, That's you got to give point. it to them. And they're in this little cage, you know, you try to get them out, you know? So yeah, man, it, it's, it really just starts with, my baby waking up i mean at that point my wife is awake as well like we're both like somewhat light sleepers mm -hmm. so at that and also like i know it's not a good habit but our puppy he, mm -hmm. our, our dog he's gonna be eight this year uh he's he sleeps in the bed with us you know no, like okay. that he's 
part of it. So like, he wakes up as well. Mm -hmm. And he also needs to be let out, you know, like he right. needs to go. He, he doesn't go to the bathroom like where we go. So we have to go. So at that point, you're up, you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. and you're starting your day. And I'm taking my daughter like in to brush her teeth, you know, in the morning at that. Usually like I, I'm, I'm up already, so I don't really mind, you know, and I, I love seeing my daughter. So yeah. it doesn't it, it's not a, a problem for me, uh, but it's the same thing with my wife. Sometimes she's up, she's going to go do it. Right. So and at that stage, I'm making my tea mm -hmm. and I like to make my tea a little bit earlier in the morning just sure. because I don't want to rush that part. Mm -hmm. And that's something that um, allows me to slow down. You know, mm -hmm. even though it's just been about maybe 10, 15 minutes of activity with my daughter, nothing more. Mm -hmm. It's still a don't like just sprint into the morning. Mm -hmm. So that's something that has that I have seen for myself since I was maybe 21, 20, like in college mm -hmm. where I was waking up. Yeah, like 5 a.m., 530 mm -hmm. and feeling ready, you know, feeling wow. energized, like I, I want to get up. Mm -hmm. And at that time, also, like I was making music, you know, mm -hmm. so like. It really was like that morning time for me was always the more focused, was the more uh, I could execute mm -hmm. quicker. Right. My ideas will come. But yeah, you're fresh in the morning. Recognize especially that. Especially for that creative energy. Yes. It's important. Yeah. Now, like for me to be creative, it's no longer a preference thing. It's very much where do I get time? Mm -hmm. Where do I, where can I fit, fit this in? Um, on a good day, I'll wake up before my baby's up mm -hmm. and I'll go for a jog. Mm -hmm. And that's something I noticed also, like you have considerably better days when you right. work out, yes. when you get those endorphins out or yeah. something like you get a sweat going mm -hmm. and you also show yourself, you kind of start with an accomplishment mindset, right? That like we have, we have an intent. I need to do these four laps. You know, the first one is going to be terrible, but we're, the second one is, third one all right fourth one we can get it and then at that point like the other things that you have in life don't seem as hard mm -hmm. they don't because like actually physically moving your body i think is very difficult and, mm -hmm. I, and it's for somebody who doesn't work out all the time who's not a bodybuilder right like you you develop that resistance mindset i guess or like that mm -hmm. to strenuous maybe tedious almost boring activity but you get through it and you do what you set out to do. Mm -hmm. I think starting your day off, I think people do that with like making their bed, right? Mm -hmm. Like you start off your day with uh, an accomplishment mm -hmm. that like I slept, but now I made my bed. It looks good. Right. Let's keep doing that. You yes. know, like, and you start off with that. Whereas folks who maybe don't, mm -hmm. they might have a, a few things going on at the same time that never actually get finished mm -hmm. or that could be finished much quicker. Right. And those are things that like right now, it's really the morning routine. Now, when it goes to my baby's routine, just mm -hmm. to give you that little tidbit, my wife was an all star in terms of uh, training, you know, and like letting herself soothe. Right. She had to hold me back a couple times when baby was crying mm -hmm. just to be like, you know, she'll figure it out. And within sure. 10 minutes, sure enough, she went back to sleep. So that happened a couple times and we realized she's good. You know, she'll figure it out. Right. And in doing that, like we set up a very solid routine. So since like three months, uh, three months old, she's been sleeping for 12 hours in her crib. Wow. So <laughs> imagine that, right? Winning. Like, as a new, as new parents, right? <laughs> yes. You, all you're thinking about is, man, I just want my life back a little bit. Oh. You know, I just want some semblance of what I was before this huge life altering experience happened. Right. Please something. And you realize that if you set up a routine yes. for these babies early, early on, meaning mm -hmm. feedings at certain hours, meaning naps at certain hours, meaning mm -hmm. you don't let this wake window go too long. You don't let this sleep window go too long. You don't let them decide how they want to do that. Like they're new beings, you yes. know, like they don't, they have no reference for anything. Everything right, right now is just pure uh, experience. That's mm -hmm. it. So you have to control as the parent, you as, as a an attentive parent you have to give them something that will enable them to live their best life as well right. and studies have shown that if you give them at least 10 to 12 hours of sleep at night and then you give them consistent naps during the day mm -hmm. they retain energy they're not crying they're not fussy even if things are different they might be quiet because they're like gauging their environment they might be nervous but they won't be 
totally like out of whack and you're not playing the you're not playing it by ear every chance you get so we we would put her down at 7 p.m mm -hmm. 7 p.m till 10 11 it's it's our time right you know as husband and wife now we get to have dinner together so that's something really important is that my wife and i continue to have dinner together mm -hmm. because we have baby sleeping upstairs yes we can be downstairs you know you got to go get that nanit you know you got to get everything exactly. on your phone so you can keep an eye on them you know there are those asterisks but for the most part if you stayed within the vicinity of your home you could kind of go go on about your life right so during nap time and during sleep time we're working that makes sense dude like yeah, man. Uh, babies uh, i feel like uh drill down this thing so much you know uh, like especially the importance of routines like before kids like i knew routines are important but after having a son i was like dude this is so important this is and necessary yeah necessary for any human to like sure. just live as a human yeah you need your routines yeah, like it was yeah. just drilled down way more right than me you know and that's amazing like you you brought up a lot of amazing points there like sure. I, I you you know i just want to really unpack some of that real quick you know yeah this is one of the books that i've been reading like, since uh, yeah since many years like okay. this is one of my favorite books like i think i bought it like 2017 or 16 or something it's the power of habit by charles duhigg it has a lot of like amazing points and one of the things that you mentioned is from this book is a uh, keystone habits you know he mentions charles mentions like how some keystone habits make every other habit just easier to do like certain like habits are like the keystone habit and then that'll just make everything else in life just easier and just fall into place it's kind of like setting the tone setting the tone just one little thing maybe. one little thing yeah and like what you talked about like the you know running in the morning jogging in the morning that's a keystone habit like it is. there's research behind like exercising in the morning and how it will change the whole day you know like sure. it just makes the entire day so much easier so much better um just because like you took care of that early on right you know that's a keystone habit and one of the interesting stories in this book man is about michael phelps uh beijing olympics michael phelps won a, a world record of world records like he right. broke so many records that year uh in swimming you know um, that it was just like crazy like it was nuts and so, you know, people started questioning, like, what happened? Like, how, how is he doing this? This is right. Superman. Um, and so one of the things that came out of it is that um, his coach, uh, he had this one coach, like, since he was a kid, like, freaking, I don't know how old he was. And this coach, um, when they started working together, this coach knew he had something just because of his body type. Like, his body type was perfect for a swimmer. So the coach was like, okay, you know, uh, this guy seems like he would work for Olympic swimming. But, you know, everybody in Olympic swimming have that body type and have the muscles, have, you know, they have what it takes to be an Olympic swimmer. Physically. Yeah, physically. Right. So, like, how do we make Michael Phelps better than the rest, right? And so he was, like, he started experimenting with things. And one of the things he was experimenting with without knowing the results or he didn't even know the research behind it. He was, like, he gave Michael Phelps a bunch of um visualize visualizations to do like in bed before sleeping waking up in the morning and those visualizations were like basically his run you know like the 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 swimming the laps that he's going to take in the pool it was just like visualizations of how everything is going to work well and that led to that being a keystone habit for michael phelps um he would basically um wake up in the morning do these like visualization exercises and then he would do a number of different things in his routine, uh, like kind of like he had a, this long routine, but he would just check off things one by one. Right. And uh, every day, like even uh, you know, on game day, like when he's racing or when he's doing his thing, um, he he would have a number of steps he would do before ra the race began, and even like to, down to the point of like swinging his hands before jumping into the pool. Like it was all routine based. Wow. You know, it was all written down. And what that did at the Beijing Olympics is that it gave him a number of wins. Like from the time he wakes up till the time that race happens, it's just a number of wins. It's just winning. So, yeah, just winning, 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 winning streak of like simple things, including the visualization. And then when he's at the race, it's just another win. You know, to him, it's not 
a race. To him, it's just another win and a streak routine. of wins. Yeah, oh, part shit. of a routine. Yeah. At the Beijing Olympics, what happened? It, like after he won like four or five gold medals this particular week, he had this another you know race. I, I don't remember which one it was. It was something, but um, on this particular race, he you know jumped into the water, and uh, his goggles was something happened to his goggles, and it leaked water in. So, but as he went to the, with his thing, uh, you know, race. What do they call this? Like swimming race? I, I, sw- <laughs> I don't get it. I don't know. I'm I trying to think about it. Like yeah. time swimming. I, I don't know. This Whatever. Is it terrible. Is. Yeah, yeah, but it's just yeah. like, <laughs> competitive Olympics, swimming. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Swim meets. I know they call them swim meets. Right. But anyways, in the Olympics. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I never thought about that. Go ahead. He's he's doing this thing, and every lap is doing. It's getting worse and worse and worse and worse, uh-huh. and. By the time it ended, like his uh, goggles was full of water. He couldn't even see anything. Okay. So he started to time his run because he didn't even know where, when the end would be, like the uh-huh. end of the lap, you know? Okay. So he timed, um, he, he started timing his run, uh, like he started counting. And, um, you know, sure enough, he reached the end. He looked up, took off his goggles, and he broke another world record. Okay. Like blind. So <laughs> post match. <laughs> Uh, you know, the journalists, you know, everybody heard about this thing with his sure. goggles. So the journalist was like, how'd you do it? How'd you do it blind? <laughs> Michael <laughs> Phelps was like, I don't know. It was just a string of wins for me. Like, I just started the day with wins and that was just another win, you know? And really wow. the answer is the routine. His routine yeah. gave him, like, he knew the pace that he needed to go. Wow. He timed it in his mind because he had those visualization exercises that he had done. He doesn't need to see anything. He doesn't need to see anything. It's just like a streak of wins on top of another win. And that visualization exercise was his keystone habit, you know? And that's that's the thing. That's like one of the keys to success for any anyone who's in a competitive sport. Um, you know, even um, artists and musicians are in a competitive freaking sport, you know? Like there are so many artists in this world, you know? Right. Like there are so many DJs. Right. <laughs> like in every block, there's a fucking DJ. Sure, sure. <laughs> it's thick out here. Yeah. yeah. And you got to win. Like, how Pause. do you get yeah. your gig at Tomorrowland uh, among this jungle of freaking, you know? <laughs> you can't. It's a, it's the, it's worse than the Olympics. You know? Right, <laughs> like, right. Man. So what, does, what makes an artist stand out? It's, you know, it has to be these little small incremental changes, these routines, these improvements. Right. That's right. what I believe. Right. Excuse me. Sorry. This is the allergies are kicking, man, today. Man. The na- nasals. <laughs> I um, feel you. But yeah. you know, like just like uh, we we're talking about the importance of routines, we have a routine here at Unfiltered uh, to like show up and do this podcast. Right. So uh, like I'm super proud of you for showing up, even <laughs> though like you get, you're nasally and no, suffering. Man, we gotta this. do it. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Dose. So identity. That that's really interesting. Right. Tell me tell me more about. Uh, you know how identity affects routines and habits so identity so first off like i got this idea because of raf like i think that was a a couple months ago maybe three months ago now you gave me the book the uh (laughs) this one atomic atomic habits right here by james clear yeah i'm still getting through it man like you know it's tough to get time right now to just like sit there and read which is something i used to love doing like especially as a as a student Mm -hmm. um reading was always great and imagination you know like working your imagination so i definitely uh, appreciate the gift and (laughs) also the fact that it just starts you know with practical things that you can do just to improve small parts of your day Mm-hmm. And a lot of that, um, they started off with uh, with identity. So I'm going to just flip to this page real quick. So they're talking about, so like if you, it's about behavior change really. And mm-hmm. like in changing your way or changing how you act so that your day is as productive as it can be. And you feel as satisfied with the effort that you put in that day. So they start off with this, uh, it's like a, it's like a circle, you know, with like a, kind of a layered approach so at the core is your identity and then it goes to processes and then it goes to outcomes so your identity uh is kind of the core right i think that's kind of where it all starts like your day is kind of de- determined based off of how you see yourself mm-hmm. and w- something interesting in that book was uh they were they were saying that instead of saying that you are trying to quit mm-hmm. say that you are not 
that. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a smoker might say, I'm trying to quit smoking. Instead of saying that I'm trying to quit, you say, I'm not a smoker. So there you have disassociated yourself from that identity, mm -hmm. which is somebody who smokes. Right. So it starts with that identity. And I think for me early on, uh, about 12, 13 years old, when I figured out that you could make drum loops off of your keyboard, mm -hmm. I identified as a creator, as a artist or somebody who was creating. It was in a creative space always. So my my day would be like, when can I do that? When can I be creative? When can I uh, exercise that part of my mind that just allows for any and everything? And fortunately, you know, at that time, technology was coming around. So as long as you had a, a DAW, a digital audio workstation uh, on your computer, you could essentially program beats mm -hmm. and music. And so that became something of a core like driving factor for myself right what did i do throughout the day that made me uh feel more or feel like i am or feel that i am a creative mm -hmm. so that was something that i like saw about uh i guess like having having the stamina to, to continuously go in and make music to mm -hmm. make songs so for example um starting out in college uh, that's when I got the keys to uh, the studio. It was like this junk space. I, I think I told you early on, like mm -hmm. it's just where they stored equipment. And um, I remember that, you know, you, you're a student first, you know, so you're there because you're studying. <laughs> right. So uh, you, you can't do this while you're trying to fit in discussions and lectures and stuff. So it's best we don't think about that. You know, let's not uh, uh, try to like do too much. But as soon as my classes were over, every day, like every day, I would figure out how I could do this homework quickly. So like, you know, we can be done with this. But then I would take my little desktop speakers from my dorm room. Actually, they weren't mine. They were my friends uh, in, a, in a duffel bag. And because at that time, the studio didn't have the, the studio monitors that they would have later in time, mm -hmm. I had to lug these uh, speakers up like to and from if anybody's been to Riverside, you know, where uh, uh, East Lothian is and then you go to the arts building, it's all the way on the other side of campus. <laughs> and I remember my friend telling me like, yo, I don't know. I don't see how, you know, you're doing this like you just every day you just keep carrying these speakers back and forth. <laughs> and like I'm like, yeah, bro, it's going to the speakers are coming, but they're just taking time or whatever. But I realized like early on, like with little instances like that, that no, this is who I am. And this is the time that I get to do this. This is the time that I have allowed myself to do this. I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to try to socialize more than I have to. Right. I'm going to get into that creative space. They gave me the keys to the studio. Mm -hmm. I would be stupid not mm -hmm. to, you know, take advantage of this, call whoever I wanted to work with to a space, you know, be like, no, I got a studio, you know, like mm -hmm. that already like gets you juiced. It gets you um, more and more uh, in tune with being that person. Right. And I remember after that, like it just after that, like it just felt effortless mm -hmm. to pursue music. Like I found a way I carved a way. Wow. And those things, fortunately, in my life, like as we move on, like I'll flesh that out more for you. But like there were always things around me in my environment that enabled mm -hmm. that identity and then the routines that surrounded that right so yeah that's, that's really interesting like uh you know in atomic habits james clear talks about that where yeah he's saying that like your identity is like really what makes you who you are and so every time you take uh you know a step towards that identity it's like voting for that identity yes you know yes and so that that matters a lot in like behavior change as mm -hmm. well like if you're trying to do something new for the first time like if uh, like you, you like you were uh, you had the identity of an artist a musician it's the same thing for new producers like if they're not a producer you know they're just a high school kid um, and but they have inklings towards production but they don't really think they're the you know best at it obviously because they're new it's hard for them to think that oh I'm a producer no at but, that at that stage mm -hmm. you can also recognize sometimes and this is no slight to anybody starting out right. but they'll say I make music right or they'll say I make beats yeah I make beats and that's, that's the great. most common thing and that's great yeah. because you've you've started mm -hmm. and even then you've like 
communicated that this is something you do. Right. It might not be there to the identity, like you said, because yeah, it even for myself, it took a hot seven years <laughs> right. after 2003, maybe in the middle of college, where I started feeling like, okay, I'm not getting jumped out of here. You know what I mean? Like I'm not getting booed off saying I haven't had any tomatoes thrown at me yet. <laughs> like I can still, I can keep pushing. I can keep right. leaning into this. And then it just became more and more effortless. Uh, you talking about like, you know, that's like a vote right. for your identity. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important that you say do. Mm -hmm. um, you have to do something. Right. You have to execute. execute. You can't have these intents in your head and let them stay there. Right. So that means, yeah, I'm going to take these speakers to and from Mm -hmm. my dorm hall to arts up until they can figure out the speaker situation there for me right. and I, i'm not gonna just wait you know and be like no nah, no nah, when it's there you know when they have the speakers fuck that bro we're gonna go as hard as we can with whatever we have yeah and we're going to uh out what do you call it uh be what, sorry excuse me i want to phrase this right i want to demonstrate more output than like what my value is currently mm -hmm. do you get what i mean like right. so that way your your value is always rising mm -hmm. because your output is never matching your current value right and then at that point like you realize that you are working way ahead of what your public perception is and you're working way ahead of what people think of you right so it's really important that you stay in your side you know you do what you were supposed to do mm -hmm. every day that had pushed you to being great right so like like what michael phelps said like this was a string of wins mm -hmm. for me when i look back on all the art that i have created yeah it's a string of wins it wasn't like a i went out there thinking i'm gonna make a song today you know mm -hmm. it was a a byproduct of my identity yeah. as a creative right and from there you start to get dope songs you know from there right. you start to get collaborations and yes you start to do x work you start to do new work you start to mm -hmm. then like start having more hats you know right. and like it just happens because like you leaned in so far into your identity, identity. but it was really important sorry to circle back long with way of saying that you do things mm -hmm. and that you execute right and that even if it's not your best work even if it's not mm -hmm your proudest or whatever like you mm -hmm. feel like you know the bet the best is yet to come you should always feel that way mm -hmm. you should always feel like i can do better right. i'm gonna do better right. and then i think when you start to feel like i don't think i can do better maybe we switch gears maybe we look somewhere else or you know hopefully later on in life much later on in life we're at a place where you can just relax, right. you know, like I think, and this is jumping ahead real quick, but in life, like Eddie Murphy, mm -hmm. you know how accomplished he is. Yeah. Uh, he was on that, um, the comedians in cars getting coffee, yes. with Jerry, mm -hmm. saying that I'm so blessed now that I just, nothing. Mm -hmm. I do nothing. <laughs> I spend time with my kids, yeah. you know, and after that, I'm nothing. Right. Oh man. Yeah. Like, I think there is a certain, like, I think there is a certain point in life where you should feel content right it doesn't get there just by intent you know right. like you have to really go in for sure and go hard for like years and years and years and mm -hmm. up until you can get to a point where you can chill out maybe. right yeah and it's hard uh like to do that hard to do that years and years and years like if it's if it's not your routine if it hasn't become like your identity it's gonna be super hard it to is, do it is. those steps and for eddie murphy yeah. to be in that stage it's because because he spent all his youth on on stage, you know, like no, being do, every freaking day, every night. Sure. Comedians are nuts. They do like <laughs> five shows a night. Like right, right. No, pe if, if people like more. Hassan Minhaj, like in in New York, he's doing like five gigs a night. Yeah, he's like, running around today. everywhere. Yeah, even today. Oh wow, really? He's already famous. He's already doing. Yeah, he's still doing. But just that's stay sharp. Yeah, yeah, and just stay, stay sharp. Stay sharp. Yeah. And to create new content, to create Absolutely. new material. And dude, the Beatles. They freaking like the sixties, I think before the Beatles were the Beatles. Yeah. They did this. You know what they did? Like they're in the UK, right? They're in from Liverpool. Uh -huh. In the sixties, uh, from nineteen sixty to nineteen sixty two, two years. I th I think it was sixty to sixty two. Two years they went to um Germany. I think it was Hamburg in Germany. And they did like gigs every night for hours. Like these are like 10 hour sets. Okay. What? Yeah. 
crazy just this is before the Beatles were the Beatles okay and in Germany um, in these like nightclubs or whatever that they performed at they they didn't care what the music was they just wanted loud rowdy crazy like just put us give us a show you know they just wow. we want to drink and y'all give us a show you know sure so the Beatles was like all right I guess so we'll do that and they <laughs> freaking they were just like we'll going hard that. <laughs> that's great <laughs> they're going hard for two years like wow. like oh, wait I have a quote actually um, all right John Lennon later on talked yeah. about this time and he said we had to play for hours and hours on end every song lasted 20 minutes and had 20 solos in it that, that's how we improved wow. playing there was nobody to copy from we played like we uh, we pay, played what we liked best and Germans liked it as long as it was loud so wow this is what <laughs> made the Beatles the Beatles you know like uh, going through this routine right. of like playing for hours and hours and hours and just like it got rid of their crap you know the sure. the bad songs were out the, yes exactly you know, two years of this this is nuts there, there's so long that like creatives spend just waiting through the bullshit yeah of their waiting. own mm -hmm. you know doing right right that's that's right and you know like um let me see there was this uh, another point that i had from this uh james clear talks about like how in that book he talks about um, how you have to like artists and creators have to let the shit like go first like mm -hmm. you, you gotta like run the tap and let all the bad water flow through Bro, yeah. and then the good water comes <laughs> you know that, that's so important um, I think if you keep it to artists you know that's one thing because it's like uh, you know it's like musicianship and you know having taste I guess and all right. that kind of stuff but then there's like I think what can be applied to any facet of life is being passionate mm. about what you're doing i think people uh they don't put enough stock into passion mm -hmm. realizing that that's been the fuel mm. but behind like everything even having a routine or mm. having habits it's been the passion for what i loved right. it just so happened to be music mm. so for better or worse that's what I was going to make my life about. Mm -hmm. And at that time, when you're a kid, like you don't know you're doing that. You know, it's only upon reflection when I look back that son of a bitch, I didn't take a break, you know, like mm -hmm. at all. Like there was not one. I feel like not one month went by without me trying music at least once in some kind of capacity. Right. And more often than not, it's just been years on end. And you lean into passion because you need to do whatever you're doing for a sustainable amount of time mm -hmm. over sorry for over a sustained amount of time mm -hmm. so it has to be like rinse repeat it mm -hmm. has to be like we're gonna fit we're gonna do 20 solos mm -hmm. and you're gonna get better you know yeah. because you're going back at it again mm -hmm. and you're going back at it again and you don't realize that like you've done 500 600 songs right you know in your lifetime that's right and that's something that afforded you the the ease and the taste that you have now mm -hmm. is because you went in with passion and that's something that wasn't going to be taught to you it wasn't going to be like articulated in a way <laughs> you could put all the posters you want up around me mm -hmm. it's not going to push me harder than what i know right. is within me right and i think a lot of folks should exhibit passion for whatever they're doing mm -hmm. and or take pride because i think that will allow you to even forego a lot of the mundane mm -hmm. a lot of the dreary and bro the amount of sessions that i've been in that i just did not want to be in there and not even because i was getting paid but it's what i want to do and if i want to do this then you got to put yourself in the hot seat as much as you can because like you're not going to always going to get that opportunity to get better right so you're taking these out. I remember one time mm -hmm. I was sitting there. This was like a six hour session and they were doing video game sounds. Oh, that's what I had to record. And wow. there was like a bunch of dialogue because it was like army generals and shit like that. Wow. The most tedious of tedious work. And that's why I think recording engineers should get paid every cent that they're owed because that is some of the most mind numbing work you know that's out there that's in terms of a cushy job you know i realize it's not difficult i realize in terms of physically taxing it's not but mentally mm -hmm. the the 
toll that it takes you know to keep doing things over and over and over and over and Mm -hmm. then they say oh i want this kind of effect can you get that and you got to be ready Mm -hmm. you know so like through the mundane you have to still do your job right you know that uh requires passion i think yes passion and and identity yeah (laughs) again yeah so then it does yeah so then like your identity is like Uh, so rooted in like how you feel satisfied with the world right that it will get you through these six hours um doing any voiceover session with all due respect and love it is so difficult it is so hard as a recording engineer to stay engaged right because they're having their way him or him and her like there were multiple people in the room but even in the recording booth like they're producing each other kind of you know talking amongst each other you as a recording engineer just kind of like yeah record stop record stop record stop okay switch tracks do this get this effect get that but then it's record stop record stop record stop (laughs) holy shit right i feel like any anybody that doesn't have passion for this for Mm -hmm. audio for sound easily would be like never again right and they would you know and and to their right they should they should go find something that gets them out of bed every day right. so i think a lot of that uh the rinse repeat that you're talking about you know doing things over and over wading through the bullshit turning on the tap letting the bad water come through before the good it doesn't happen just because of intent it happens because it happens because you did mm. something continuously day in and day out and you got better at it right and the mastery will come i think it just comes yeah uh that's true as long as you continue right yeah i think uh you know you're absolutely right like mastery in anything like if you you know greatness in anything requires like the person to uh, get in the habit of working even when they don't want to get work you know right no matter how creative you are no matter how like talented you are you have those days where you just don't want to show up. You don't want to do it. Like yeah. you just don't want to do it. <laughs> but like, you know, George R. R. Martin, you know, a Game of Thrones author, right. yeah. he writes six pages every day, no matter what. Like, yeah. He will write six pages. Sure. Even if it sucks. He'll just do write. it. Yeah, he'll just do it. Just do That's it. That's his routine. He got in that habit. Yeah. You know, um, uh, J.K. Rowling, uh, Harry Potter. Uh, she writes every single day. She says like every day she's gonna write, even if it's shit. You know, wow. she's just gonna write it, just cause like it's just what she does since right. she was like young. Now, the, you know, the real question for our audience is that like, how do you get into that habit? You know, like mm. if if you're not doing it every day, like if you know if you're tr- trying to write an ebook or like if you're trying to do something, how do you how do you get into this new habit now? Okay, I, I you know I have a goal. I want to write an ebook. But uh, how am I going to write this? <laughs> no, okay. So yeah. even uh, Atomic Habits has a great uh, thing. Again, this is all within the first like 40 pages. Mm-hmm. Like they just start with like practical things that you can do. Right. One of the, the first things um, is uh, the, one of the first things was uh, make it visible. Mm-hmm. So they, he was talking a lot about the environment mm-hmm. and that your environment does shape what you do and who you are mm-hmm. essentially. So if you're, let's say, trying to write an ebook, let's make your laptop visible. Mm-hmm. Make it something that's in the place. Maybe put it in a workstation, work area. You know, some place that is dedicated for this. Right. So now your environment, you don't, you don't. Uh, one place, one use. Yeah. That's what he says. Hundred percent. Mm-hmm. And I think you find yourself if you ha- find yourself more productive if you have a concentrated amount of time mm-hmm. in one place, right. and you don't go in with the expectation that I'm gonna take three to four hours, mm-hmm. like don't don't come in with a start start small yeah don't come in with the lag mentality especially if you have a if you have a busy life if you like bills don't get paid on their own right uh family doesn't uh wait or stop family doesn't uh and that is honestly to me that this is a little sidebar is the most important because Mm -hmm. like in spending time with them because that's time that you don't get back right and if people start looking as time as currency i think a lot of things would change and i think mm-hmm. a lot of like mindset would change but facts if those things are not going to move they're not if they're not going to budge mm-hmm. like you have to find concentrated amounts mm-hmm. of time even if it's just a half hour yeah where you jot down notes but it's right. in a particular place right maybe it's it's on a particular notepad or mm-hmm. um some people are fortunate enough to have dedicated machines you know so they can have a computer that's for you know just writing and right. if you have something that's dedicated, that's in your environment, that's visible, chances are you're going to pick it up. Right. Chances are you're going to try and, you know, even spend five minutes. Yeah. And if you spend five minutes, that's a vote towards that identity. 100%. Yep. Just do something and do it like, 
don't expect yourself to start sprinting mm -hmm. you know like there has to be some kind of habit real quick there's a and this is just that something that my cousin said um his dad wants to go to the peak of everest oh, okay and he's like yeah uh six months i'm gonna be up there and uh, his uh his uh younger son his youngest son is a doctor now and um he's my, my cousin uh he's like he, do you know how much training you have to do you know the minds the the state that you have to put your body into before you can go do something like that which is incredibly high up the oxygen's different you know all that kind of stuff plus you are 60 plus years old mm. your body is not that of your mindset which might be 30 you know which is great but like he was telling me that his dad has his thing about you know just like going off into sprints he'll do six miles seven miles but then for a month he won't do anything uh. you know but then he'll go do something big where so it's like in, when it comes to doing bigger, you know, comes to, to larger goals, which is like climbing Everest, uh, you have to put yourself in a routine. Your body right. has to feel like it is a climber. Right. It is uh, adaptable and ready for harsh environments. Exactly. You can't expect yourself to just get up off the couch and start with the, you know, the, the giants or start with the bigs. You know, it's mm -hmm. just not going to work like that. You got to do little things, do little incremental mm -hmm. progress as it goes along. Like when I was making music in college with a lot of people, had live shows with DJs, I think I was doing 20% of the mixing that I'm doing now. Mm. But I was doing it. Mm. My mixtapes would be 19 tracks deep, 17 tracks deep. Well, it's because you're not really doing the work, bro. But at least you are putting tracks out. Right. At least I'm somebody on who it. puts mixtapes out. Mm -hmm. I'm a producer. Right. I am an artist. Right. That's at that point I have proven it. The, mm -hmm. It's right there. Right. It might be ass. You know, you might not like it, but it's there and it's, it's there. and it's done with genuine intent. Right. So that when you look now, when you go further, 2015, 2017, and the songs that you put out, like people are like, oh, this is dope. Mm -hmm. And then like 2019 came around where like I actually got to sell a couple of my songs to a major label mm -hmm. like that doesn't happen because like 13 year old Sahir was like i'm gonna sell songs on the mm -hmm. label i'm gonna have that track ready no there was life experience there was right. like dedicated over a sustained amount of time so i think like the importance of passion is also sort of like kind of overlooked right when it comes to uh when it comes to being great right that's that, true like, that like this is what allowed a lot of these people that basketball players entrepreneurs uh anything artists wh whoever whatever have you whoever does it at the highest level they did it because they were passionate about what they were doing right that's, so true. that's something that like i think like if people search for what they're passionate about they'll find themselves more often than not being great at it mm -hmm. you know and like passionate doesn't mean that you do it as a hobby passionate is that you you do it like a professional yes yeah, that's that's important like to be great you got to do it like a professional you have to and, and uh, you know like your example of like make it visible that you know in, from atomic habits yeah it's like uh, that has like for a, for a guitarist for example it means that put the guitar in your living room so you can go to it and start playing yeah and you know the reason why james clear talks about that is because like that's the habit loop q uh ha the habit loop that like yes. dr wendy wood i think came up with this okay and everybody like jumped on this because this was amazing research right um she came up with this uh, habit loop of like q uh response Plus, yeah. and reward and so, reward yes and it's just a cycle exactly cue response reward and so like if you see the guitar there that's the cue and then if you go do that thing even for five minutes you know you put a vote towards that identity of a guitarist and then you reward yourself right after and you keep doing that over and over again right. soon you'll become this person who does who plays the guitar and like really well just because that's your identity and then you will grow that passion and if you you know if you have intrinsic passion already you will do that more and more and more and more you just fall in love with it so part, much so we're talking about like making things visible so that you can enable yourself to put votes in for that identity mm -hmm. but then like there's other parts things things that you can tangibly do right. meaning like making it uh making it attractive mm. so a guitarist might put their guitars in the room but 
maybe get a nice guitar you know <laughs> like maybe like oh, do what you can to nice. like make your environment somewhat conducive um make it attractive hang on i'm gonna reference it so i, I don't like get this it. wrong but he's james clear man he got it like from the jump yeah this is page 54 so it's like real quick but um make it attractive make it easy and make it satisfying mm -hmm. so he talks about cue craving response and reward mm -hmm. so if you make it a crate so if you make it attractive you crave interacting with it mm. so for me like a lot of that really had to do and i know it sounds vain but like what i was looking at so i tried using other software mm -hmm. it was looking very dreary it was it had like a gray sort of you know sort of look at it and sure. the buttons looked kind of like they were from the 80s it didn't look like <laughs> they were the the what do you call it the user interface you know i don't yeah. think people were putting the time into that but then GarageBand came along mm. and the way that Apple true to their form <laughs> and their brand the way that they made yeah. their their standard you know DAW the way that something that came stock in your mm. laptop the way that they made that look mm -hmm. and how easy they made it look to to actually do what you wanted to do it made you want to come back right and I remember so again shout, shout out Sunit, uh Bina Mami Rajiv Mama um and Sona and Neil the whole family <laughs> that whole family man like they they were very uh supportive of my creativity mm -hmm. so much so that like uh they would let me come over virtually anytime um so long as they were home to use Sunit's computer which was at that time the iMac you know it's like mm -hmm. the freestanding yep monitor the colorful ones no 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 oh. it was the solid white oh, one. Oh, right 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 uh -huh. and, and it was like this was like we got like garage band now mm -hmm. and at that time again this goes against making it attractive but <laughs> we we took the xbox mic it was like a dynamic microphone from the xbox mm -hmm. we coiled up some of the wiring and put it into a lampshade you know those lampshades with the bendy arms yeah 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 so we put the mic in that ah. and that went straight into the aux in into the back of the computer wow again make it easy mm. whoever's at apple made it easy you know like they made it easy for a creative to have the bare minimum to just record themselves on a, like a real track system and then right. they had the loops right there mm -hmm. you know so you could just start building out beats as you wanted and i remember we messed around a few times just like off of loops nothing else just their yeah. loops understanding creating the environment like creating the whole song start to finish and understanding like oh this is just how you really extend beats out you know this is how you create transitions all that kind of stuff um but going back to it was that they made it attractive and it was attractive uh at least what i was seeing which is what the daw was granted that microphone setup wasn't attractive <laughs> but it was something that we were easily working past mm -hmm. because like we just love doing this so much right. so that's something that did kind of trump the whole make it attractive part mm -hmm. but it was really the DAW, which is what I wanted to point to, which is then they went to Logic. Mm -hmm. And Logic to me, like, just is leaps and bounds in terms of UI, right. in terms of how it looks. Mm -hmm. And that it's very easy to navigate this thing to figure out, okay, this is the channel that's focused on. These are all the tracks that I have. This is the piano roll if I want it there. If not, it's simple. It's not cluttered. It's not something that like, oh, I can do this here. We can do this here. We can do that there. And then you have like an option overload, which is something that I think happens a lot. So they made that attractive too in that it decluttered the space and made it easy to work with. And then see, that was making it easy, which mm -hmm. is the third thing, which is the response. And then you make it satisfying. And at that point, the satisfying part is like tough. That's where the whole like, you know, you're like you wade through the bullshit. You're right. trying to find melodies that actually satisfy you mm -hmm. and you outgrow loops. Right. You outgrow uh, the presets that people may have had for you. Mm -hmm. Now you're like, no, I start with a blank canvas every time. Mm -hmm. I might have a dedicated vocal plugin chain, but besides that, everything else is very much like elastic because like it's like satisfying to me now to have like that kind of freedom. But beginning like before that, like those first three things, I think they're so huge to right. building behave to building this identity, which, you know, like kind of is informed by your behavior. Right. Um, I think if people did take the time out just to make like their spaces a little bit more conducive to work mm -hmm. and didn't try to work in the kitchen or didn't try to work while they were, you know, taking a deuce. <laughs> like if you just really 
compartmentalize, put things where they should go, and then you operate like that. Right. You start to, I think, feel free when you're not doing that. Mm -hmm. You're not. You're not like concerned about okay, when am I going to be able to do this again, or what's going to happen the next time, or like anything right. like that. This is like your routine. You're set. Some things are predictable. So now, like, you can focus on things that might not be as predictable, which is like raising kids. You、right. know, like that.、Right. Your timetable might get stretched a little. You know,、right. or you might find some unexpected free time. You know,、mm-hmm. it goes both ways. Right.、Um, That's right. But a lot of that has to do with like your environment, man, and making it. Uh, conducive、yeah. to wanting to、yeah. do this like this, like where we are right now.、Yeah. This is like it makes me want to come in here and talk and listen to you, you know,、right. and and have a genuine conversation. Right.、So. Yeah. This, you know, the science behind it all, like behind creating habits, makes sense. You know, it's like all all right. You know, it it's like you know, cue, response, and reward, and、yeah. just keep that loop going. But the thing is, like, when it's hard to do that, like when it's hard to create a new habit. You you know humans will always fall back to their identity,、mm. so that's why it's so important. Like that we're talking about identity, identity. first. Yeah, like, that's the first thing. If without that identity, none of the rest of this happens. Like the cues, like for example, even putting up posters on the wall that that should inspire you or something. It those are cues. You know those need to be cues, but they will work if you follow that identity. Uh, you know, off you know the cue that you're trying to right, right. impose on yourself. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I think like <clears throat> there's this、uh, you know metaphor, this analogy that I've been like kind of cooking up in my head regarding identity for some time now. And I I you know I'm I'm passionate about this. I feel like you know identity is so important that it's like kind of like the cruise control in a car. You know, when you're cruising, like for example, like when you're going at seventy and like the road is.、Um, Uh, like downhill, right? The ro- road is downhill, and you know the car starts going fast. The cruise is gonna pull it back, you know, make、right. it slower. You're just gonna start braking. Yeah, bring it back to seventy. You know, in life, it's like if you're cruising at a particular level, but then like if if you get a lot of fla-、uh, if you like speed up with things, like if you're getting a lot of things done, your body's natural identity will go back to where it needs to get back to.、Mm. You know, it'll just. Bring it back to、it'll、like equilibrium. Okay. You know, every it'll、time. check itself. Yeah, yeah, it'll check itself. And so it's it's it goes every way. Like even like、uh, for example, like if、um, if the if the if you're cruising at seventy, but then the things slow down. You know, like there's bumps on the road.、Uh, the road is moving like you know a little different. Car starts to slow down. The cruise is gonna kick in and make the car go at seventy. You know, ba- back、keep、from sixty. Keep it going. 60, yeah. yeah. Keep it going back to equilibrium. Right. In life too, like if if you are like used to like for example like for artists,、uh, for if if an if a musician is recording an album for next year,、uh-huh. right? He's this year he's recording, recording, recording. If an author is writing a book, releasing for next year, he's writing, writing, writing. Entrepreneur, we're getting ready for a launch. He's creating the launch, you know, for next year. He's preparing all the marketing. He's doing right, all the things. Right. The, these times are really like, you know, like where they're focused. They're in their flow state. They're they're working every day. Yes. They're feeling really good. You know, they're going at it. Right. Next, you know, they get into this habit of like doing a lot, a lot,、sure. a lot. And then like next year comes, you know, the album launches. The book is out. You know, the product has been launched.、Mm-hmm. Things kind of like, you know, and it's it was a success. Things are working out. You know. People start to get a little comfortable. They feel like, all right, you know, I did it. You know, that goal is now done. Right, you know,、right. they may want to like, you know, enjoy their fruits a, a little bit. You know, the artist, if he made money, like, you know, hey, you know,、yeah. like, let's put a down payment for something dope. Sure, you know? sure. You start to enjoy it, but like internally, what happens? Like, you start to feel like, you know, like I should be doing something. Like, I don't, you know, I'm just hanging around these days. Yeah, you know, because、yeah. that person is used to that past. Like that last year, they spent the、that、entire time. That high octane. Yeah, spent the entire、yeah. year like working on this album and not not doing doing、anything. doing doing right. Yeah, right. Th- that internal cruise control is gonna want you to like keep it up, keep going, you know. Right, right. Keep doing something new now because that's your identity. This is what you do. This is what are you doing? Yeah, slowing down? Yeah. What, the, yeah. What, what do you mean? We don't slow down. Right, we right. We do something else. So the artist might be like, all right. Another album, or the, you know, go on tour. You、oh, know, right, the book right, right. author might be like, "Let's do a book tour. Let's write another book." Right, right. something like that. You know, it's、sure. just, that internal cruise sets the precedence. You know, that'll、so、that. that'll bring you back to equilibrium. So, how do you establish identity? Yeah. So, like, yeah, that's a great question. So, what do you like as a? I mean, as a kid, like, you know, like, how do you figure out who you are? Right. So, this is a very interesting question. I think I believe, you know,、um, personally. 
when uh, when people are young in the teenage years and then in their 20s i believe one should go out and put that vote towards as many identities as possible <laughs> to see what works and what's clicking and what's 100%. pulling you what what is making you feel more passion you know because it's it's hard to know like in your 20s or even teenage years it is it's hard to know which one is the right one you know yeah. like me like me just like you uh have many different sides to my life you know yeah. like right now as we speak um i'm a podcaster you know i'm an entrepreneur i'm a dad i'm a you know um i'm a i'm an author i'm writing th- uh, you know i'm writing books right now i'm working on a lot of different things different ideas i design mugs yeah. you know there's a <laughs> lot of identities but you know some yeah. of it is you know the main ones which is like the creative identity right right but uh, i've had this all my life you know and, and when okay. i was younger when i was interested in music i just leaned into it when when was that real quick can you remember uh, yeah it was it was a high school yeah it was a high, high school, school maybe 10th 9th grade where you start to feel like i i'm going to be dj like I'm yeah gonna... yeah it was more like hey you know we were jamming with buddies and it or was where's like, that was that fun. when you were rapping too were you yeah yeah I was, okay, yeah i was rapping right. too i was okay. doing rap battles cuz okay, you know 8 no. mile was out yeah but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah. but I was just leaning into it. Yeah, you know, I was just leaning into it and it was fun, you know. Yeah. So I was just doing that, you know. I I didn't really know how to make this into anything, you know. You know, if I could just something you you said earlier on was like it's difficult it's difficult to know what's right. Right. You know, like what's the identity for me? I loved your uh, uh thought process of put votes towards as many identities as you can. Yeah. And that's see what allowed clicks. to you. Yeah. Because I think that's important. That's mm-hmm. uh that you try things. Right. And that you are open to things. Right? I to feel like, that. you know, um identity is so interesting. It's like you you know, you first got to have awareness of where you are right now. I think self-awareness is key. If you're driving at 70, if that's your cruise, you got to first look at the speed, speed speedometer and see like where you're at, you know? You're at 70. But if you're driving at 70 and everyone around you is driving in 80, 90, and some of the people that you left with, they're driving at 100 and they already got to the destination that you're trying to get to. Uh-huh. But you're still driving at 70, you're miles away from the destination. That's the time to ask yourself like what the heck can I do Whoa. to get to that level, you know? And the answer to that is and and you know naturally if you put yourself around those people who are at a different speed limit different speed than you naturally you're going to want to increase the increase you'll, the cruise. you'll do it yourself yeah yeah, yeah you're going to want to increase that cruise control like you press the gas yeah naturally. i'm not too happy with the 70 that i'm cruising at yeah. let's let's put it up a little notch neither you know? are the people that are watching you or yeah. that are trying to help you right they yeah. realize that you have the potential to go as faster yeah there's push the pedal yeah. let's go push, yeah and it's just, that's important That's the environment that you were talking about, putting yourself in that environment. True. The five people around you make you who you are. Those five people better be at a different level. Yeah. That way you can up your level, 100%. up your cruise control, you know? And and I think that will come naturally once you lean into that identity. Yes. And then you know as James Clear mentions in Atomic Habits, every time you do that, it's a little vote, you know, towards that identity. For sure. So like in in this metaphor with this car cruise control, It's like instead of like cruising like from 70 that you were at just going straight to 80 or 90 that's not going to stick you know instead doing like a little bit little bit little bit little bit every day putting at a little volume yes. every day a little higher speed you know the next day it's 72 next day it's 75 next day it's 78 all of a sudden one day you look up and you're, and doing, you're doing a buck 20 yeah yes yeah. you're 120 holy yeah. shit we got to <laughs> slow down the cops are coming and that's it yes <laughs> yes and at that point it's like i think the universe makes its way for you you you've read the alchemist yeah. yeah yeah so when you have like real intent and you have passion they talk a lot about that right. like beginner's luck and they talk about you know or sorry he talks about man i can't remember his name the author's name but uh quello 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 yes yeah. exactly <laughs> thank you name <laughs> rath your encyclopedia <laughs> that's awesome yeah uh Yeah, quella well, the way that he talks about just going through your journey, mm-hmm. um doing honest attempts, trying things, right. putting yourself in positions for sustained amounts of time. Mm-hmm. It's not all going to come together right when you go out there, but the more that you cast out these votes, the more lines you cast out, mm-hmm. the chances are higher that something's going to really grab, something's going to pull you mm-hmm. in a certain direction and right. Luckily for me, music was there. Right. I realized I needed significantly less physical capacity to 
make music right. and that was something that i love doing and i love and you know in the beginning like it's like uh one of the things that to touch on make it attractive mm -hmm. so to me it was attractive to hear myself come out of a speaker when nobody else had that capability around me right so they're like same here is that you Right, you know like right, right. and we we're like feeling, yes yeah. me you know so like that That's vain right. thing that you had man i use that so much That's to push so me past that phase where now like i'm not uh giddy just by getting into a vocal booth i'm right. not happy just because somebody sent me a beat you know For like sure. any like you get all that stuff out of the way mm -hmm. the novelty the consumerism mm -hmm. and then you see if you're really cut out for this right and then the again the universe makes it clear that you are right and you you go through different stages and there's different like signs throughout the way that validate your effort but that's because you continue to do something right <clears throat> yeah i think like you have to deploy a lot of self-awareness and self-love at the same time because like self-awareness yeah. will tell you what is working for you this is a whole other podcast yeah. self-awareness and self-love yeah yeah Those that's a whole other thing bro. that's right yeah but like you gotta like while you're trying these things out and casting votes you gotta be self-aware about like, is this feeling good? You know, at the same time, wow, yeah. you gotta have self-love because some of those things that are not for you are gonna fail horribly. Yeah. And, and you can't get out of those situations feeling like crap. Like, oh, I saw because I yourself. tried this yeah, and yeah, it didn't yeah. work. No, no, <laughs> yeah. self-love. Like, oh, I tried it, great. It didn't work, let's try something else, you know? Right. Self-awareness is so important. Like I started my music career, like I've worn every single hat in the music business. Like I like to say that yes. I'm sure I didn't, like 80 20 let's just say yeah. i wore 80 percent of the hats in the music game agreed me too throughout my life and you know i was a rapper at some point you know right. and i knew that i'm not a good rapper because i was around rappers who were so good <laughs> and i was like i'm not good at this you I'm know chill out a little yeah it's the same thing with those basketball players right it's yeah. like i would chill out a little yeah. <laughs> yeah. i didn't cry about it no. i didn't feel sad i was no. just like what else could i do you know and djing was the thing and engineer so, sound engineering or real something quick, else yeah real quick not not sorry to interrupt you there but what what in your life uh afforded you to say what else can i do instead of wallowing in your <laughs> you know i mean i grief. was a i guess i was a you know teenager or like no i was in my early 20s did so. you have any examples around you of people um <laughs> Uh, at that time, I didn't. And in my early uh, 20s, right. I was, uh, you know, in college and I was, you know, first gen immigrant. I was the only guy here. My sister was here, uh, yeah, but she yeah. was doing her master's grad school. And, I, you know, uh -huh. yeah, I was in a small town in the, in the Midwest. I didn't really have like artists around me and so, shit like that. You know? So that's even more commendable. Yeah. yeah, but it was attractive to me. It was like, hey, no, everybody else is nerds here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we could put them on. I can DJ. We could put them on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it made me feel good, you know. But um, yeah, I, you know, I was just pulling on the, <laughs> I was just pulling on the thread of music. Like I knew I liked the music game, and I was just pulling on that thread. You so know, that's that what I was trying to like. I guess for our peoples out there that might not have that passion, that might not feel that thread to pull on to to be compelled to pull on this certain thread, you know, mm -hmm. like I was introduced to a lot of different things like in my life, but yeah, music compelled me. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was. I don't know what inside right. me felt like I needed to get back at this. Mm -hmm. I know I'm trash right now, but I'm gonna get better. Right. I'm definitely gonna get better. Yeah. And, and I think uh, having examples around you, you know, might be one way to do that. That is right. But yeah, again, when I look back, I have my cousin who knew how to play the drums very well and know, knows how to play the piano very well like just off an ear and he knows like chords and things who taught me how to make music and uh you know shout out up and like the way that he like doing like chords and leads and all that um sure. he besides him there's not somebody to tell you like how are you going to make recorded music and then push your artist career that yeah. i learned on my own right but then again like that i wouldn't have learned that if it wasn't for this passion that i have mm -hmm. so now i'm all i'm trying to ask is like how do you do this without that how do you search for passion i guess mm -hmm. and you telling me that like putting you know your vote out for everything what compels try you to be like no let me go do this let me try something else let me try something else <laughs> Right. Uh, Is that I, an innate personality? Thing? I don't know. It might be, you know, because like I'm, I'm like I'm a born entrepreneur, you know, like I know that I wanted to make impact in the world. I know mm -hmm. I want to 
add value to people through the things that I'm doing. Like I want to make products, I want to make brands, I want to I want to do something like that. Like I don't want to just lie around and just like watch the world go by, you know. But see that that shows that part shows mm-hmm. in everything that you have done and are right. doing currently. Right. That part, that yeah. part that you want to exactly. change lives, that you want to impact others, that yeah. you want to X Y Z. So I think folks should maybe that's a huge umbrella that's a giant umbrella mm-hmm. you can impact people in so many ways right and maybe you start with the little ways you know right just like atomic habits you start with the little votes you little, can start impact by impact them little by little you can start by impacting like let's say you're a kid living at home impacting your mom's life by cleaning up your room you know yes, <laughs> like yes. making that part of her life see how that does that your little action there what kind of effect that had how did that make you feel right was that satisfying hopefully it is and you like to see you know people feel good about what you do you'll embody that in different that's great right that's yep. something and then hopefully along the way you'll find a thing that you yeah. really are passionate about right and something that it compels you to get out of bed every day right. like and show up early you right. know and go above and beyond right yeah that's, ah, that's so yeah <laughs> We can sign off on the next one right here. Uh, th- that that's batteries did. Oh, that was the sound of the battery dying. <laughs> Damn. But this is what we do, though. This is what we we have to grow have to past all of this. Okay, so eight five, I think. Yeah, you know, so uh, you know, I think this is a you know great episode. I think today we're not able to go into all of the details that both of us sure. wanted to get into. A, our cameras are fucking dying. <laughs> yeah. And B, uh, <laughs> we're going through it. We're going yeah. through it. We'll get through it. Yeah, we're do- we're we're still doing it. Uh, so this is great. But we got to wrap up. You know, this just means we got to do another episode yeah. about routines and habits, just because it is important. You know, we got to share what works for us as well. Yeah. You know? And yeah. we'll do that next time. Absolutely. But for to wrap up today's episode, you know, I want to ask you, the audience, to go. Uh, you know, comment or like write down in your journal or whatever in your phone. Or, <laughs> yeah. Okay, text your buddy and, you know, sort out what is a proper routine that could work for you. You know, like yeah. what works for you to optimize for your growth? Like, what do you need? Right. Do you need to get to work? Do you need to like be that passionate uh, guitarist or DJ who DJs every day or producer who, you know, makes a beat every single day? Do you need right. to do that? And are you not doing that? You know, like then you got to ask those questions. Like, how do I make this right. a habit? Right. Or are you doing all those things, but you're suffering through, you know, um, uh, you know, procrastination or like. Uh, maybe you're not meeting enough people. Yeah. Maybe you're not meeting enough people. Ask yourself those questions and see what are the new habits that you got to make for yourself yeah. this year, 2023. Um, and then, you know, towards the rest of your life, because, you know, it doesn't take too long to create a habit. Like no, it doesn't. Some scientists say 21 days, some say 60, some say 90. Whatever it is, just do it consistently day right. in and day out. Don't count how many days. Just try to just give yourself a reward every time you show up. And, you know, yeah. that's how you do it. And keep going. Yep, keep going. Well, All right, man. Yep, that's the episode. Thank you, Sahir. Yeah, again. <laughs> Til- till next time. Till next time. Let's do it. You know, if I could just something you you said earlier on was like it's difficult it's difficult to know what's right. Right. You know, like what's the identity for me? I love your uh, uh, thought process of put votes towards as many identities as you can. Yeah, and that's see what allowed clicks. to you. Yeah. Because I think that's important. That's mm-hmm. uh, that you try things. Right. And that you are open to things. Yeah. And so yeah, I'm thinking back, man. Like and and NJB the uh, National Junior Basketball League. That was the and I went there from, I must have been like second grade till about eighth grade, maybe something like that. Mm-hmm. And I remember in high school, uh, going out for the high school team. Shout out Evergreen Cougars. Uh, they uh, they had the the conditioning, you know, like it goes from. It, <laughs> did it, yeah, dude. Did uh, okay, for sure. I can keep going here, but anyway. <laughs> Real quick, real quick. I'm just keep going, just so you can hear this. <laughs> no, just keep just listening. Real quick. I'm listening. So the, <laughs> um, the the conditioning wiped me the fuck out. Like you know, like you're like, 
just totally tired. It was like Monday through Thursday after classes, you had to go run laps with the actual team. Like the, the team's already, oh no, the varsity team. And so this is for the junior team. So you're running, man, and you are dead after three hours of conditioning. And you do this for four days. The fifth day was tryouts. I never made it to tryouts. Like I was just at home, just collapsed in a heap. And I remember thinking to myself like, okay, I tried this. I tried this for two weeks. And this is the second tryout that I'm not making it to. Mm -hmm. And the coach at that time was like, yo, Sahir, I see you conditioning. Where are you dribbling the ball? I don't see you dribbling the ball. You're not dribbling. That means that identity wasn't me. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't, I, I couldn't do what they were asking me to do. And then some, mm -hmm. you know, like you have to be able to do that. And then some to actually feel like this is right to feel like this is what I should be doing. Right. So that little story to me just came to me like that. Yeah. It was very clear that I'm not a basketball player. Right. I can play basketball, not a basketball player. So yeah, that's man, cool. That was the, that's a good story. <laughs> I wish that was on video. <laughs>